<laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Bet Online. It remains your number one spot for NBA, MLB, MMA, boxing. It doesn't matter. Every single prop, every single play, every single point, it's all at Bet Online. When it comes to bets, when it comes to props, everything that you need is at your headquarters for sports betting. That's Bet Online. Head to the website right now, use your mobile device, sign up, get a 50, that's 50% welcome bonus. Don't forget to use the promo code. B L E A V, that's believe, to get yourself a 50% welcome bonus. Come on, there's no need to hesitate. Bet online where the game starts. I understand it's not something comfortable to talk about, like your sexual function or your sexual performance, but don't sell yourself short. It is important. But you know what else is kind of important? Not being totally embarrassed by going to a pharmacy or having to deal with a doctor when you're talking about prescriptions when, with some of these drugs to help you perform up to snuff in the bedroom. That's where Blue Chew comes in, okay? It is the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis at a fraction of the price. And the best part is, is you don't have to deal with anybody. It comes right to your door. You're never ever gonna be as happy as you are now to see the postman coming when you know that the package for your package is right there, all thanks to Blue Chew. Do yourself a favor, head to bluechew.com, use the promo code LIKES, get your first month for free and see what I'm talking about because you deserve to have the best sex of your life. And thank you Blue Chew for sponsoring this podcast. I hope you're ready to have your mind blown with the greatest health and fitness information on the planet. <laughs> yes, bitch! Welcome to the Mikey Likes You podcast, the greatest health and fitness podcast on the planet. Again, I'll remind you, no one else has really said that, but no one said that that Michael Jackson was the king of pop. He said that. And then people are like, okay. And Howard Stern's like, I'm the king of all media. And uh, people just started to buy into it. So I figure if I just keep planning that in your head, eventually we'll all collectively agree that this is the greatest health and fitness podcast on the planet. Uh, thank you first and foremost to Bet Online, to Blue Chew, and to First Detachment, the greatest health and fitness podcast, or excuse me, greatest health and fitness supplements on the planet, bar none. Uh, my podcast last episode with Justin Harris, the co-founder of First Attachment, has gotten a lot of positive feedback. And that's because the man knows his stuff and he knows how to create these formulas for the absolute best supplements that you need and none of the stuff that you don't. Today's guest is officially the only guest in Mikey Likes You history that I've impregnated. From what I, I mean, from what I can gather, I would have said uh, the only guest that I've had sex with, but of course, Dr. Drew has been on the show, uh, so we have to check him off as a man that I've made passionate love to. But I'm, of course, referring to my wife, mother of my child, Bianca Kylik. Hi. I've also had sex with Dr. Drew. That's true. I know that's not true. I mean, I know it's a joke because <laughs> uh, you, um, your vagina is still intact, and the, uh, Dr. Pinsky's meaty hog has been known to just there's been women found cut in half all through Pasadena, California. I mean, Susan Pinsky has a, an iron vagina. Iron. Because Drew was just augering her out so often that they had to put in. It was the very first time I actually, I, I talked about this in depth with both Drew and Susan because it was the very first medical procedure where they sewed a woman back together because Susan was in two pieces. Like you get chopstick at the sushi bar you know you bat bat and that's what drew did with his thick look how happy it makes you <laughs> to talk about this like your eyes i never see your eyes light up about anything i talk about uh, no as much as yeah, you talk about no <laughs> <laughs> but stuff i talk about you do you see it light up but it's always stupid shit i don't like i don't like anything any other adult pretends to like uh or most adults take things really seriously and the reality is, is they have like very little control over that stuff like politics or world peace or and you don't I mean you can be invested in it. I'm certainly I care 
about world peace. I care about everyone's well-being, but I have very little control over that. But I can care great, very deeply about Scooby Doo because it means a lot to me, and it makes me, and it makes me, and talking about Drew's thick, veiny cock, uh, I have just as much control over that as I do over President Biden's uh, policies, and this one actually makes me happy. So, yeah, but you are also, I mean. Let's not gloss over everything and say like all adult things because you there's things you're very serious about that you that are, are would be considered more adult. I'm interested. Topics. No, I'm interested in a lot of adult. I'm in very we got, we got the whole way over. We were talking about kind of like recent American history and 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 I'm I care deeply. I'm interested in the federal government. Deeply interested. I, I find it fascinating. I find it interesting. If you want to show me a documentary about Air Force One, I think, uh, whoa, this is so cool. And CIA and the FBI and anything military related. I, I, I It's not that it doesn't interest me. It's that you, like you said, I get the smiley eyes when I talk about, uh, you know, I was Ghost Rider. You know, the movie Ghost Rider. It's the shittiest movie. I've, Nick Cage. Yeah. And I love Nick Cage. Yeah, we used to send each other. That was when we first started dating. We used to send each other Nick Cage memes. And I love, I love him. He's the greatest worst actor in American history because he is so amazing. But he's also just can make pure shit. But in Ghost Rider, there's a scene where Ava Mendez is getting stood up at the restaurant by Nick Cage, and she starts drinking because she's like realizing Nick Cage isn't going to show up for their date. So she's hammered. And this is like 27-year-old Eva Mendez. And the waiter comes up. And she's like, I can't believe he's doing... Do you think I'm pretty? And the waiter goes, eh. I was like, fuck off. First off, do you not care about tips? Is that just not in your fucking vocabulary? You're just gonna be like, eh. You would lie to any woman. And uh, there's no man gay enough. She didn't say, she didn't say, do you want to have sex with me? She said, do you think I'm pretty? There's no guy gay enough that would be like, no, no, I don't think you're attractive in any way. Of course, everyone has eyeball. I'm straight. If I was a waiter and Idris Elba is drunk and he goes, do you think I'm handsome? I'd be like, oh, fuck yeah, look at you. I mean, this. I think this is something that, that, Hollywood has uh, improved upon one of the areas, one of the very few areas in which it has improved upon uh, as of late, which is I think that in the past, you know, mostly movie stars and, and, you know, actors and actresses were, were incredibly ridiculously good looking people. And then they tried to make them play parts that were supposed to be maybe not so good looking people right now with streaming and whatnot you get people who actually look like real people playing all sorts of different parts but back in the day you know it was like always the joke right with the when it was supposed to be like a nerdy girl they would just put glasses on her and it would be some <laughs> really no beautiful. the great the best one was uh god she's all that yes because Rachel Lee Cook. Rachel Lee Cook. That's right. Literally put on a cardigan. And glasses. And they're like, look at this beat, bitch. <laughs> and I was like, wait a second. What the fuck is happening? But, you know, it, it, there's recent ones, too. There's a, a movie, I think, just outside 17 or 17 or something with Haley Steinfeld. Okay. Yeah. Is that, is that Haley Steinfeld? Stein, Stein, you know who I'm talking about. I know who you're talking about. And she plays like the ugly, dorky high school kid. And I was like, wait, we got to stop this. Cause she's like, yeah, is she Margot Robbie? No, but she's really attractive. Like no high school boy would be like, look at this beat ass whore. Right. <laughs> That's Hollywood. It's still Hollywood, you know? Anyway. So I, I brought you on the podcast because for two reasons, one, our daughter's at summer camp. So we're kind of stuck with each other and we're like an actual. We're not stuck with each other. It's been wonderful. No, but I couldn't like, there was no evasive move, move maneuvers to get you not on the podcast because. Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. I would like to rewind. Okay. Could we discuss the conversation that happened last night? 
What was the what was the conversation? You, but you act make it uh, you make it look like or sound like like uh, that you had no other choice but to have me on. I didn't say that. I said that there was no evasive maneuvers I could pull. <laughs> but that how does that not? Because I asked you to be on. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't like you forced your way in. Right, but like you could have easily come here today and just been on your podcast by yourself. Yeah, but I thought it might be interesting and 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 people <laughs> people certainly like it when you're on the podcast. They do. I you're a very contradictory person Why? sometimes. Cuz like I I just so If Magnolia was not at camp and she had school or things I would be like, "Oh, I you know, I think about having you on, but you got to take Maggie to camp because I got to work. So do you not want me to be on your podcast? I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said that there was no maneuvers. Sometimes you just got to deal with like the. Yeah. The the maneuver is you just go, I'm going to do my podcast. And I would literally have not said two words about it. I, I would have been happy to do you not want organize to closets. And do you not want to be here? No, I, I'm, I was excited to see your new exactly. space and meet Giorgio. Exactly. And, yeah. See, and it's a th- and also I was like, well, she can give me tips on how to do the lighting and stuff because you're really good at that. I am really good at that. And uh, you have very strong feelings about it. <laughs> you don't look that good. <laughs> your eyes are baggy. <laughs> First of all, I don't ever say it like that. Your eyes bags are very dark. Do you ever disagree with me? <laughs> no, in fact, I'm always the one. I was like, I, <laughs> I remember I did Drew show one time in here. And uh, you're like, how'd it go? I was like, it was fine. I just, I feel like I feel old and beat and look like shit. I don't even know if I want him to put it up. And then you watch it. You're like, it's fun. You look, it was fun. That wasn't right? in here. That was it. In uh, Austin. I in Austin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes you're hypercritical about yourself. And I, I feel like it's a good thing in our relationship that you know when I'm being honest, because I'm always honest. I never, like, I tell you when it doesn't look good. Yeah. But since you were doing that voice, will you, can we tell the story about how Magnolia makes fun of fish in the engine? <laughs> well, she should. That was preposterous. How you could go. All right. So this is early in our relationship. We weren't even engaged. And we're going to Coachella. We're preparing to go to Coachella. In fact, we had just, we had been broken up for a little bit. We had just gotten back together. All right. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, so we're not even engaged yet. And uh, we're getting ready to go to Coachella. And I get like everything ready. We pack our bags and stuff. And because it's early on in our relationship, uh, we weren't, we had separate residents. So uh, I go and I pick her up. And I had brought my dog, Coco. Coco, yeah. Because yeah, she's, at this time, I mean, she lived till earlier this year. She was 18 years old. But by that time, she was already old as fuck. And she didn't do any, you know, she wasn't going to ruin our trip because she doesn't need No, she's much. awesome. She, yeah, she just lies in her lap and then, yeah. and we could leave her in the hotel room and it wasn't going to be a thing. So I was like, oh, I'm ready, Coco. And she's like, yeah, it sounds great. So I go with Coco and pick up Bianca. And she's hungry. Bianca's hungry. And I was hungry. I was like, let's get tender greens. So we go and we call in tender greens and I go and I pick it up. We get back in the car and I fire it up and I'm about to pull away in Marina Del Rey, California to go to Coachella. And Bianca looks at me and says, do you have a fish in your engine? Listen, first of all, what? that's not the first thing I said. I said something smells really bad in here. And then I looked around. Yes. And then I could not find the and, source and of it. And then you said to me, <laughs> do you have a fish in your engine? Yeah. And I almost crashed my car because I said, why the fuck would I have fish in my, do you, am because I barbecuing that, like, on my headers? Because sometimes that's a prank that people would pull on each other where someone would put a fish in someone's engine. That's like a known thing. Right. And. All of my prankster friends just happen to be hanging out of the parking lot at Listen, Tender you, Greens. <laughs> well, no, like the night before or. Turns out Coco's anal glands needed were to be expressed. Quite juicy. But this is so we had to we had to drive somewhere in the Palm Desert. We found some vet that had to s- squeeze the stuff. Yeah, out it was of like a, like a like a like a strip mall Petco. Some guy agreed to do it. But the best part of it is Magnolia. Our nine-year-old daughter loves this story. 
and she tells it, but she imitates Mike's imitation of me, which yeah. I don't think sounds anything like me anyway. It doesn't. But how does she- that, But you do get, when you get a particular, into a certain level of panic. Yeah. You get, you don't talk the same. <laughs> So what is the her? And You're like, do you have fish in your engine? <laughs> I don't. It was like when you need it, like when you get hypoglycemic or like I need to eat. I'm yeah. Like, you get, oh, don't you have a protein bar somewhere? <laughs> Isn't there nuts anywhere here? Why do you not have snacks? I was like, very, why do I not have snacks? Listen, it's, an it's, automobile. A, it's a very panicky state when the blood sugar level drops instantaneously and you realize you're nowhere it feels like you're going to black out. I think that's a female thing. It, yeah, it might be. It could be. Well, that's it why, it that's doesn't why happen I don't anymore. think women, by and large, do as well with intermittent fasting. Yeah, but I, I go long periods now. I just changed what I eat. And now that I changed it, it doesn't happen anymore. How would you change what you eat? More protein and less bullshit. <laughs> but the crazy thing is, is that even like, because I've been on a little bit of a bullshit spree for the last couple months. I keep saying like, months? yeah, you're going to get it after this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, 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 because of the time leading up to that, I ate so clean and yeah. mostly more protein, less vegetables. But it's more because look, I think any, anyone, unless they're getting a sizable paycheck for their body. Yeah. Everyone goes through those phases, right? Where they're just hyper motivated, uh, really disciplined, however you look at it, right? With training and eating. And then it's like Monday, I'm start, And then it just every Monday comes by. Yeah, and, and it becomes a whole new and thing. And it becomes harder. And I, and I don't, <laughs> my feeling on it is, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking myself included, not like I'm someone separate. I, I, I go through the same thing. I don't think it's a matter of motivation because I don't think it's something that you can manifest. I think ma mo motivation genuinely can be. You can tell your, you can sit with yourself and be introspective and try to develop motivation to do something. I don't think you can motivate yourself to be healthier. I think it's something that happens organically that you can't control. Yeah. Well, I mean, I noticed that for sure, where sometimes I'll say Monday, I'm going to clean up and I'm going to, you know, focus on good, clean foods and, um, cutting out the sugar and that kind of stuff. And sometimes Monday shows up and it's easy peasy. Like I just go into the week and sometimes Monday shows up and I'm like, where are the cookies? I'm going to go get a boba tea, I'm gonna whatever, you know? And I, and I just, two things are at play though. One, uh, I think what I what I'm saying there's some truth to it. And I the only reason I say that is because I can't I can't make certain that that's the case that you can't manifest this that you can't just have internal will and that belief and that you go for it. Which which in life I think you can do that but not when it comes to health stuff. Um is because it's the very similar to re like recovery. I don't think that you can just like think your way into not doing drugs or not drinking anymore you have to that's why they there, there's the cliche term of like rock bottom is that there's there's some moment and it doesn't necessarily have to relate to how bad your life is yeah um where there's this moment where you have this clarity where it just starts to make sense and i i, I on a much lighter note when it comes to eating right and and training i think that that happens for people well it, i mean i think it it all boils down to um, like what's, what is your, what's the intention and when, or, or what's the goal and when, cause when I have a clearly defined goal, like for example, I know I'm going out for this part and you know, if I get it, we're starting shooting in two weeks, three weeks. Uh, I, I, that's, there's no issue. Like it's, that's not even like, yeah, but, that, but that, that bleeds back into what I was saying about financial motivation. Well, yeah, but that's, that's not financial motivation for me because I, I you, you're talking about specifically literally financial. Uh, yeah. Like I, I do think it's, di things are different for actors, fitness models, yeah, but models, I, because you, you can, 
you can forego a lot of the struggle that you because you go like I this is how I pay the bills. Yeah, but it's that's not. I mean, I don't. I, I, listen, I we need to pay our bills, but that's not why I do what I do. Like, no, it isn't what you do. Do what you do. But in the same way that like, here's how. I look, like, okay, I remember when Slayer did their f- final tour, and I went to the show, and all my friends are like screaming their heads off, and I was head banging and having fun, but I I wasn't screaming because I had to be on the radio the next day, right? And I didn't feel. Like I, I wanted to scream and yell and, and throw out requests, but I was like, well, I, I pay the bills by talking. And if I go in with no voice tomorrow, like it's not only an F you to my coworkers, it's an F you to how, you know, how I stay afloat. And I think that if you are going to be on camera, if you're going to have someone take pictures of your abs or whatever, you can, you can bypass a lot of the like internal struggle that some people have with eating right and training because you go like, well, this is, this is what I got to do, you know? Yeah. But I, but it doesn't, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't, I don't think it matters what the incentive is, whether it's financial or whether it's, I I think that we tend to prioritize, like you said, yes, the things that are what we do for a living or something that we really care about. But I think what we fail to kind of differentiate between is the fact that there are there can be things that you care about that matter as much as paying the bills but that maybe aren't so black and white in in terms of how you you know think about yourself or how you think about um your well-being and i and i think that it it is just about what is important to you and and we tend to think more about things being important to us like paying the bills, like what we look like. Um, but you know, I know, for example, when I, when I back, you know, two years ago, before we moved to Texas, when I started doing predominantly carnivore, the impetus for me was not about what I looked like, even though that was an incredible byproduct of that choice. For me, it was, I wanted to see how healthy I could actually feel. I, I was tired of getting sick all the time. Yeah. And um, and even for me, that's I don't get sick that often, but I, I really wanted to, I was curious to see how far my body could go. How, how strong could I get? How disciplined could I be to go to the gym five days a week? Um, how, would it feel to make choices like I'm going to choose this steak and, you know, this uh, fermented cabbage over a piece of cake? Why are you laughing? (laughs) Why is fermented cabbage funny? It's not funny in in like a laugh at laugh at you. Haha. It's funny because like, that's really what you were eating. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I I was there. I was one of the few people that can. I, I went for, I mean, I think a good like six months before I had a piece of sugar, like even fruit. Yeah. I think we, I think we had one, I think 4th of July, we went, we went. Big. No, but that was planned. That was planned. We went and it's our we ordered nation's a, birthday. <laughs> we went and ordered a bunch of crap um, and it was really fun. But the next day I was right back on track. Um, and, and the thing is, is I think like we tend to prioritize the things that by societal standards are what is important. Putting a, a roof over your head, how you look, to people yeah in pictures or otherwise um but oftentimes we don't think about for ourselves what that means like well, how does it feel two things i think you're right i think the, the the your motivation to do it what is whatever your motive is is huge because even if it is financial even if it, you are an actor how many actors have we seen who get shredded for a role and then Two months later, they're a fat fuck. Yeah, we, you know, there's so, a lot of so people like that. I, what I think is, is like, my, my only point was that it's e- you can't really manifest motivation unless someone's paying you. I think you can if someone pays you. You can manifest will. You can manifest discipline. But that's not sustainable. I think doing it for yourself is what's healthier, what's more sustainable in the long run. Um, I also think doing it for enhancing your life and the look coming as a byproduct of it is absolutely a way better route to go. Well, yeah. But I also want to point out, 
I think far too many people get tricked into thinking that doing it to look better is a bad thing. And they get really guilty about just saying like, you know what? I just want to fucking look better. I want to take off my clothes and look in the mirror and be proud of what I see. That's okay. In fact, it's pretty awesome. It is. You know what it I'm is saying? awesome. Like, and, I, and I think it's oh, mostly women too. A lot of women nowadays, like, like guys have had this renaissance where you get to 40 and they're like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to get abs. And, and I think it's really cool, you know, but women now are like, like you accept yourself at any body weight and any size and you're beautiful no matter what, unless you lose a lot of weight and look amazing. And then in which case we're going to fucking shame you. Right. You know what I'm saying? Which is that, that again, it's the, it's all the, it's the, the external, um, it's, it's the, what is it that externally the viewpoint is? It's not about what's coming in from here. And I agree with you. And I think that's a really important point to make, which is that if, what is true? Like, what's the truth in your heart? What is it that you want? Why do you want this? And there is no right or wrong in that. Like, if you're like, I want to do this because that asshole dumped me and I want to strut in front of his face and show him what he could have had fine like if that's what's true if that's what you but i think i think that especially now um with social media and with the way that we put ourselves out there there is this shaming of for the if it's for the wrong reasons i don't give a shit what the reasons are as long as they are authentically what you feel in your heart. And sometimes I think we're so far from what that truth is because we think we have to make it about something that has integrity or we think, but integrity is what is true for you. And also you don't, aren't obligated to share that with anybody. As long as you're honest with yourself, I think about I agree. the reasons why. Yeah. It, there is this notion. I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, new age pseudo celebrity who's going to bitch and moan about people's access to because you i think everyone who gets into uh, a job in front of the public eye you understand you're you're sacrificing a little bit of your privacy but there's a thing uh, specifically with like twitter and instagram uh where people now assume like they they believe that you are obligated to explain everything to them like if you know like if you why didn't you post about this this day i'd be like why hey why do you assume i have to answer that question like i have a life do you really think i'm gonna you know i remember that that was the big one that got me was like supposedly there was a day uh where for black lives matter you were supposed to not post anything if you did post you had to post like a black square right and uh i'm not by any means like anti uh civil rights movement or or, or, i'm all for uh the black movement and the whole thing but i also didn't fucking know that you know and like a a bunch of people are like well how come you didn't and it's like i'm gonna take this time to explain to you that i uh have a life that i didn't wasn't aware you know that i did but also then i was like no why do i why do i feel obligated to answer that question random stranger and that's a weird thing it's like i notice it a little bit like this much because people by and large are really nice to me online i i compared to some of my comedian friends and radio guys people are really nice to me so i only i i don't necessarily experience it that bad but i do get the if i post anything shirtless or exercise based uh i get the guy who's just like not even like a fat slob or an alcoholic or anything but the regular dude right? Drink beer drinking kind of guy who likes to have his burgers who says that like I'm a dork or I'm gross looking and that a real man drinks beer and has burgers, you know, like, and I, it, I started to like really dissect it before. Cause I don't, I don't respond to that. There's no upside. I'm not going to be like, well, actually, sir, if you go back to the the ancient Greeks, and then you look at the Spartans. It's a, a man takes care of the. I was like, wait, what am I doing? I, I don't even answer. But what I did do is I thought about it, and I was like, why did I start working out in the first place? Why did I quit drinking? And what? And it wasn't because uh, of anything else. It's just like it didn't feel like it was me. 
Like I didn't feel, I, if I get over a certain level of body fat or if I don't take a certain level of care of my body for a certain amount of time, I genuinely, I was like, this isn't who I am. I, I like to obtain a certain physique and I like to have a certain level of performance. It just, it's who I genuinely am as a person. And I was not, even as I was drinking and using, I would be up at four in the morning for the like third night in a row. And I'd be like, this isn't who I am. And I had really dark thoughts and I was like, why, but I, I'm the guy who cries about Pee Wee Herman passing away. Mm -hmm. I'm not this guy. Like, who, what, you know? And so the main impetus for me doing all this stuff in my life was like, well, that's just not who I really am. And, uh, I'm not a guy who eats lots of burgers and drinks lots of beer. It's, it, and it, there's no, there's nothing kind of political or social behind it. It just, that's not who I am. And it doesn't make me right or wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and, uh, it, it it's way, I, I, I will say, and I hate to play like the gender game, but from what I can see, it's a way cooler game to play for us dudes because, uh, it's just a hot mess for women and body and like you can't be too ripped and you certainly can't be too fat and you certainly can't, you know what I'm saying? Like everything's a problem amongst women seemingly when it comes to image and if you get plastic surgery, you're a fucking fake whore who's trying to fit. But if you don't, you're old and I could see your crow's feet and it's like, I just avoid all that as a guy. It's seemingly well, I mean, certainly in the circles that you travel in, I mean, I think it does exist in the world of men. I don't know that it's so much maybe worse. Hollywood, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But even in Hollywood, like how many older actors, how many 50, almost near I say 60 year old dudes are going to be in an action movie in 2024? And how many 40 year old women are being having this crisis where they're like, I don't know if I'm gonna work anymore. You know? Yeah. I mean, like not even fucking Paul Newman movies when he was 60. The The Rock will be in a series of action films. Jason Statham will be fucking dudes up on camera at 50 something. Like, you know, I guess, yeah, of course, there's the JLo's of the world. But for the most part, that's not, you know. I don't know. It's uh, it's more and more. I feel like there's more. There's been more things for women in in the upper age ranges. I, th I think yeah. it's changing, and I think it's changing for the positive. Um, I do think Hollywood's changing for the positive. I was speaking more so about like women amongst other women. Like yeah, even I mean, Justin I, Harris and I were talking about it off the air because he was dealing with his clients before we got started. And two of his competitors at that weekend at the Chicago Open were female fitness competitors. And he was saying, he's like, dudes will just kind of ignore another guy if he shows up with a bad physique. Like he doesn't show up or he compete, he, he places fifth because they're so consumed with their own. Yeah. Women will shit, man, and women are hard. Like, like they'll shame each other. Like if they don't show up at a certain level. And I was like, ah, man, wow. See. And I noticed it um, more so than anything when I would like, look over your shoulder on the like pregnancy chat rooms. I was like, you ladies are fucking brutal. Like the breastfeeders versus the formula versus the home birth versus the hospital. It's like, well, I mean, you know, I, I think like I try to think, look at, get underneath the reason why, yeah. why is it that way? You know? And I definitely think that women, uh, change themselves or do certain things way more for other women than they do for men. I think that it's yes. there. Th I think that there is a, a popular theme of saying that it's the men that make us do things the, the certain way, but I actually do believe it's more the women. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think like when you try to look, I mean, I always try to go back in time and look at things from like, where do we come from? Where, how, what has the journey been to where we're at, you know, and women, if you look back at, you know, way back when we were, when we existed in tribes or we were in, in organized communities where the, where the men went out and hunted and. No, you don't have to go back just different parts of the world now. Right. And, and women, um, really held the space at home, right? The, the, the hunter gatherer, right? The women were responsible for the community, for, 
holding home for the children, for unity. And I think that the farther that we get outside of that, where there isn't a, a, as much of a sense of connectedness with each other, I do feel like in the same way that men are at a loss because they don't have such a direct purpose of going out and and literally killing for survival and defending, um, you know, men who sit behind computer desks all day and we're not meant to do that. I mean, you and I, the majority can, of you and I can attest in the to, Western world, right? The majority of men in the Western world, not only don't aren't going out and killing uh, to feed themselves, the majority of men in the Western world are working white collar jobs now, which is way different than it ever was. Most, most men were plumbers, electricians, construction workers. And there was a very narrow kind of margin over here of accountants and attorneys, you know, all the way up until like, when we were kids. Yeah. Now but I mean, kids. you go even further back, e even men who were learned men, men who were thinkers, and uh, just think about how much more dangerous daily life was, you know, in, in order to even go somewhere to travel great distance was, was a huge threat. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so li life was, there was, there was a lot more peril in just everyday life, um, which in a weird way does give you a sense of purpose. It gives you a, a, a defined kind of idea of I need to do this and I need to survive. And I mean, you and I, I think even just in having our farm the last two years, our, our kind of understanding of life has deepened on a much greater level yes. to how you, I love how you say, you say like nature isn't cr cruel, it's just indifferent. Um, yeah, everyone, everyone always has this two, like, you know, you hear the, like the vegan PETA person was like, nature's beautiful nature is so perfect in every way and i'm like okay and then there's the guy you know the defeatist or the guy i was like nature's so met you know nature is metal, metal yeah nature's so cruel and i was like i don't think i think it's completely indifferent i think hungry animals are going to eat an animal if they see it and uh that's that and i don't the, think there's any not malice meat. or ill will and i don't think that this plant that just encompassed a fucking lizard and dissolved it I don't think it didn't like the lizards. It's like, that's how things go. Yeah. You know, like, and it's, and it's, and it is brutal in, in the way that it, it's, practice, it's yeah. it executes its need for survival, um, its desire to consume. Um, and, you know, I think that I always try to remind myself as we're out there on the farm, but also I was saying like, just you and I in our, how much more we move in a day. I mean, I remember um, someone telling me, you need to spend more time outside than you are inside. And I thought, how will I ever do that? But on our farm, it's, there's not even, I don't even think about it. I, I just am. Two, two stories, right? It was, you know, we were both kind of really involved in counting our steps, right? And getting our, and back in Venice and other parts of California. And you had to really put in work, right? To get in that 10,000 or 8,000, whatever you're shooting for. You, you had to make an effort. You'd go, it's like, okay, I'll walk the dogs again. Okay, maybe I'll just go down to the beach real quick or whatever. And uh, out here, like I averaged 12,000 without trying. Yeah. Without trying. And to you think. usually are getting up more near 20,000. 20, and another one is, is like I have those captains of crush grippers, you know, because you realize real quickly if you want to get any good, have any level of like uh, ability in grappling sports, you have to have grip endurance and grip strength. You know? So I start, you, there, there's like levels of it. And then the, the top one is like a thing, like if you can send in a video of you crushing it, you can, you like you get put on a board and everything. It's really heavy. I don't know the, the levels of resistance, but it's, it's like hard. And when we were living in LA, I got up to the, to the second to last one and I could squeeze it one and a half times, but I couldn't even fucking do the heaviest one. And uh, without trading my grip, living on the farm here for two years or so, the other day, just for fun, I went by and grabbed the heavy one and I just crushed it, you know? And you're like, oh. But then, you know, you hear the story and, and a lot of like fitness guys and gals will wax poetic about like the lifestyle we used to live when we were more active naturally. And that the average man, you know, of course the high level athletes have never, no, there's never been a faster, stronger, higher jumping man or woman 
than the greatest athletes on the planet right now. And not even close. It's not even every year they get bigger and better and faster and stronger. But the average person yeah. in 1930 was like LeBron James compared to the average person in 2023. Yeah. And you realize like, oh, that's just it. That's, that's the lifestyle, you know, the, of living. And one thing that I have appreciated way more now is I have a lot of stuff that's really important. Maybe not on a global scale. You know, I'm not changing lives and stuff. But every day, there's 20 to 30 experiences I have, little mini ones, where I'm like, I'm really important to this chicken <laughs> and to this goat. And if I didn't go for this walk right now, these coyotes may have gotten in and our dogs would have gotten into a fight. Right. And their guts would be spilled. or So me and my existence has value because of all the cre different creatures. And for you and for Magnolia. Yeah. Well, and, well, and you're, it, I, was, I was at a very, I was at a large dearth of that in the city. And to bring that back around to what we were talking about in regards to the women, but also for men, um, is that you recognize that, would you say that, after the last two years of our life, you feel a stronger sense of purpose and connection to self, that you yes. are more connected to yourself. Yes. So I believe the only reason we ever find any reason to point fingers or to in any way judge or criticize something that someone else does is because you don't have that connection to self. Because what I have found is within the last two years, I become more aware of when I am critical or judgmental of someone else um, because I can recognize it as my own lack, my own feelings of insignificance. When you feel that way, the only thing you can do to try to make yourself feel more significant because there's nothing rooted in, in reality that's grounding you is to try to make yourself feel more significant by pointing out how others are insignificant in whatever way that they're doing. Right. And I think that men, um, you know, or more masculine type people can find that significance through uh, uh, things that ma more masculine type people do, which is m men have a very different way of bonding than women do. M yeah. Men can somehow fall in with each other in a way that is, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's kind of like children in a way. It's like you guys, you can, I see you, you go to the gym and suddenly you're talking to everyone in there. Any guy who doesn't have a shirt on comes up to you without your shirt on. And it's like a beef fest. Yeah. Um, Little do you know that we're going to the bathroom with our poppers and lube. <laughs> okay. So All right. Rack it up. <laughs> God, <laughs> I know. No, but you, you uh, listen and the same, and the same thing goes is like, you saw it. I, I bet you could see it a lot with your sister because your sister practiced jujitsu and was re got really good and was yeah. really committed for a long time. The difference between your sister and her husband when they walk into the academy, it's a different. Like when I walk in and when I or if I go train with Coach Vic, train Muay Thai, go lift weights, like there's a thing. Like you get, yeah, there's a like a. First off, A, there's a primal thing about it where I, I feel kind of just a little bit relaxed. Like my shoulders go down. And it's like, hey, buddy, let's go. You're kind of into the same thing I am. Yeah. Which I'm sure is very, I'm sure comics deal with it when they go into a green room. I'm sure actors probably, you know, when they show up, like people have a common thing where it's like, if you're into physical culture of any type. But also guys, and you took a long time to get this through, like to really understand Guys genuinely shit on each other as a sign of affection. Like you never understood like how horrible I would be to some of my friends and vice versa. And you, I, I don't know if you ever pieced together. Like it was really only the guys that I really cared about and like trusted, you know? Yeah. Like but random people aren't shitting on me the way that, you no, know, some of my friends. But I also, I also think, I mean, that's a, that's a deeper conversation there. Cause I still, I still to this day think that, I understand it's a sign of affection. I also understand that it's a sign of people that are deeply uncomfortable with being vulnerable with each other. Maybe because you're right. I mean, like 
Like cops. You ever see cops together? Like yeah. cops are horrible to each other. Military guys are horrible yeah, to each Yeah, but look other. at look at who you're bringing up is men that have to put themselves in situations that are deeply life-threatening. And so I agree, but they but, have to have but a But it's certain also not only life-threatening because like a construction site, dudes are horrible to each other. Yeah, but... Giorgio, I, do you... Like you go on the mats? Most of the time, like the guys you like the most, you guys bust each other's chops, right? In both the construction sites and the mats. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, and and I almost feel uncomfortable. I, I used to feel uncomfortable in the Hollywood situations where it wasn't like that. I genuinely... I would be well, at Access Hollywood. I would be at... Play, and I would go talk to the grips and the, and the cameraman all the time. And I would be like, uh, what's up with some of your shoes? <laughs> like, you know, and like... A guy would be like, oh, I'm a blue belt, too. I train. I was like, Good, don't make me fucking break your arm right here on camera. You know, like, and there was a, there was like, both of us were kind of like, oh, now I'm relaxed, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's called breaking the ice for a reason. But I, 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 I found it weird when dudes would be specific. I'm sure, it, I'm sure it's like that in Madison Avenue. It's like that on Wall Street or something, but I'm not picking on Hollywood in specific. But it like, you know, you go meet with people like me and everyone's so like extremely complimentary to each other. And I was like, oh, everybody. Yeah, but that, but that is, balls it's, here? Yes. I mean, but that's also a, a form. It's all forms of the of the armor that we put up that we don't allow people because it's kind of two sides of the same coin, really. You know, it's it's our inability because nobody's really, truly comfortable with themselves these days. I mean, there are some people who've gotten to that place. But I, I think like, doesn't mean we can't joke around with each other and rib each other, but a lot of that that happens is as a, uh, exists as a substitute for real intimacy and connection. I, 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 I agree, but I disagree because most of the guys that were the most brutal in professional life and my private life, most of the guys that are the most brutal to me were be the guys that I would be the most comfortable being vulnerable with. Okay. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? Like I knowing that there's that level of trust where a, I could shit on you, you could shit on me and we could shit, we could be self-deprecating about each other in front of each other. Um, there was something about that, you know, like, uh, like Kevin, Kevin and Bean were fucking brutal. We were all brutal. Like the way we showed a fact, we were fucking horrible to each other, but they were the greatest guys on and off the mic. They would do anything for me. And I felt really comfortable opening up to them and talking to them and yeah exposing I'm, not, I'm not saying that that just because that's there doesn't mean the intimacy or the connection it d doesn't exist yeah. um i'm i just think that a lot of times it is a sign that there is a lot of stuff behind a very well-placed wall a lot of um, you're probably right and i think most guys period just by virtue of having a cock and guys that are traditionally macho have it even more. Yeah. I think there's a more, there's a, you know, uh, the hardest people to get into a therapy chair are people who've been to war. People who are cops in Baltimore and cops in fucking Washington, you know, like really gnarly neighborhoods. Um, you remember when I went and talked to those crips yeah. in, in Compton? And this kid's like 70 years old. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, my younger brother got shot and killed in front of me. And then I had to, you know, duck to drive by just on my way to school the other day. And I blah, blah. And just like extreme trauma. Right. And I said, if that was if it was available to you to talk to a mental health professional, because you're a young man and you've dealt with a lot that has inevitably affected you, uh, would you do that? And he's like, I, I don't even He's like, that's like asking me to go to space. I can't even imagine talking. Well, yeah, about, I know. mean, it, it's a, it's like what we talked about through all of the political upheavals and everything that's happened is that um, it's why people hold so tightly to their beliefs, you know, to the things that they think define their world. Because, you know, when, when something traumatic happens to us, and most times those things happen in our childhood when our brain isn't properly developed and the brain doesn't know what to do. That's why people go into shock because the brain can't process the information. So if you have a young kid who's just witnessed 
a shooting yeah. and someone that they care about dies, the, the brain doesn't, it literally, it's a death. It doesn't know what to do with that. And so we have this incredible survival mechanism, which just takes that information and just tucks it into a, a dark corner. So we're just going to put this over here and we're going to put a little blockade in front of it. And then that way I can go on with my life. I can do my day-to-day -day functions to make sure that I survive, but I'm not going to have to deal with that thing. That's why you always hear about people like suddenly in their adult years, suddenly remembering they were molested or, you know, yeah. but, but the problem is, is that then your whole life moves forward and the, and the deep, dark, untouchable place never gets dealt with or processed or assessed even or or supported and you go through life not really feeling anything yeah because you're protected from the deepest darkest things you do feel i don't know everything you said is i think is correct you you have to learn to tuck that away to keep going right but i only think that we have this midlife crisis or this big fallout from the trauma because we've developed this lifestyle where we have time to think about it. Whereas like 6,000 years ago, if your kid got eaten in front of you, you're like, oh, that sucks. I loved my son or daughter. She just got eaten by a fucking lion. But right now I have to worry about running away from said lion. Yeah. Well, it's going to eat me. And then in 20 minutes, I'm going to have to go find other food to feed my other still existing family you know what i'm saying like it's 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 like the the malaise that a lot of guys feel when they come back from war right because they were living this world where none of this mattered none of this bullshit mattered right but what because else i am keyed and i gotta go moment to moment of living this life where i'm engaged and things matter and then you come back to a place where 23 hours of your day kind of doesn't yeah. You know, and I went and that's when all those thoughts come in and you're like, oh, fuck, man, I watched a guy get blown up and stuff. And it, and that's inevitably that's uh, without question. It's immense trauma. But when they're in it, you talk to you talk to uh, and, and Lord knows how I many my friend network has grown to be uh, an extensive amount of, of war scene veterans. Um, You talk to them when they're in it. They're like, that was cloud nine. It was and it wasn't until I came back to boring world. Yeah, but that what, I didn't feel did like have? I had, you know what I'm saying? What else did they have here, there, though, when they were there in it? I know you read a book about this. What else was present? Fear, trauma. But the brotherhood, right? Oh, yeah, no, the com camaraderie. Yeah, the, and, the camaraderie. And, I, and that's the other thing, I think. You go back way back when, again, yeah. we had our community. We had a tribe of people. We Mandatory. Had, yeah. You were fucked. You can't take on. If there's 10 chimpanzees. And you have three humans, you're fucked. You are fucked. You need 40 humans or else you're, it's. But it's also why like it's so deeply ingrained in us, this need to be liked, this need to be connected. Because if you were ostracized from that tribe of people, you didn't survive. Yeah. So, you know, all of this is like this deeply ingrained, n these needs inside of us. But we also, like you said, we, we are, we have less purpose um nobody none of us really know what the heck is going on right now right like the world seems divided in 18 different directions and um our tribes have gotten have, have lost meaning because we're connected to each other through digital yeah. means and yeah people don't put a premium on doing shit anymore because they can just or pretend. they do it and everyone's sitting there on their Freaking phones, you know? It's a bummer. M Mike and I, we, you know, we went and looked at a new school for our daughter. And it was so fascinating because we walked in this room and there were kids and a lot of them were teenage kids. And the thing is- Pre-teens, dude, like, like the peak age of shithead. They were, they were middle school, which to me is like prime shithead. Not one of them was on their phone. And, Tablet or anything. And they, we walked in and they were like, hey, guys, like so engaged, so connected. Yeah, I had to pee during the interview. And I was like, I'm really sorry. You guys can do, but I really got to go back. And she's like, okay. So I go through like the center of this building. Geez, and when I come out, there's this like, I don't know, 13, 12, 13-year-old 13 girl waiting to use the bathroom. And I was like, hey. And uh, 
she's like, and I'm like, yeah, sure. Fist bump, yeah. I'll fist bump you, little girl. Like, uh, like most kids would be like, oh, scary adult man, you know. And, uh, I did wash my hands, so I was happy about that. And, th- you know, this is brings me to another thought about Magnolia that I, I, I don't believe is something that you or I have, like, quote, unquote, taught her to do. But it's something that I'm so impressed by, um, which, again, connects back to our conversation about you know, women or, or men being judgmental or, or, um, critical of others. She's had a couple instances where like a friend was being not cool yeah, and said not cool things. And I say to her like, what, how did that make you feel? And she's like, it's fine. I know that so-and-so's little sister is sick and he's probably not getting very much attention right now. So I could see why he might be feeling the way he is. Yeah. And I just like, I think like it's taught me to be that, try to find that, you know, connection with other people in my life when they act that way to really, instead of take, you know, it personally and say like a person was a dick to me or they said this but to, to understand like where they are at and what's going on for them i think that's so remarkable that she does that i agree uh i've always told you i said even when like magnolia was like six weeks old i was like i don't care if she goes to college i don't care if she's a doctor or if she is a custodian like all i care about is she's not like a mean girl like it's all that matters to me I don't care. And uh, it feels like, you know, we've at least gotten this far where she hasn't become that. But you touched on something is a really interesting because I've been thinking about a lot where like now the movement and I think it's more so for like influencers. Because I don't even know. I'm not saying that I'm not saying anything derogatory. I don't know. I don't watch any television. Literally zero. We We will stream a show here and there, but we don't have TV uh, I, I don't know any of the like reality shows right now. I don't know if that's a thing. If that if that it has a lot of currency with culture right now, like reality TV and stuff. But I do know like YouTube people and like influencers definitely do. And I think they're towing some line that people are trying to catch on to. And I don't know if it's true, A, or if it's right. And that is the whole like, I don't care what people think. You, know, like you hear a lot of people be like, I don't care. I don't. I just don't give a fuck about what people but You do. know what's so funny about that to me? You know, within a second of meeting someone, if they're truly a I don't give a shit what people right. think oh, person. Yeah. I remember uh, there's a couple people I've seen. There was one person during COVID. I can't even remember what happened, but he was like a jeweler or something like that. And people came in and he had signs up. Oh, they're in mean, Jersey. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, 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 and and his, I was like, I don't even care what that guy's stance is. I like him because he's he so authentically does not give a shit. Yeah. And and I I think that when you know we we do, you're right. We've gotten to this place where like the I don't give a fuck attitude is very en vogue. But like, how many people who are actually it's, you know, uh, putting that out there, well, like also, actually don't I mean, it's give a totally fuck. disingenuous. But also on top of that, I don't think they get what that means. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> because unless you're a sociopath, of course you care what people, I don't want people to think I'm an asshole. I care. Yeah. I want people to meet me and around me or experience me to go like, that's a nice fella. I like that when he's around. Yeah. I care about that. It matters to me that people like me or dislike me. But I also think the, the notion of I don't give a fuck is more what popular culture. I don't care if they're critical of me. That's very. But like everyone we know, like, like I've been lucky enough. You obviously as well as you're much more successful in a, in a traditional Hollywood sense than I am. But we know people behind the scenes. Right. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of comics like really well. The most, the kings of don't give a fuck, typically behind the cameras and off mic are really sincerely nice people. Like Daniel Tosh is a really nice guy. Yeah. But no one gives less a fuck than Daniel Tosh. Yeah, I would say. Maximum king. Him and Joan Rivers might be king and queen of don't give a fuck. And like when you're, when he's not filming or doing a special, like 
He's cool. Like, it was a really genuinely nice guy, seemingly. David Spade. David loves to do that snarky, sarcastic, like, oh, I'm I'm above, I'm better than you peons. I'm, yeah. David's, like, a really nice guy. Yeah, and know? I think David gives a fuck. Like, David, of course he David, does. He's, a, well, like, one of the sweetest people and, and very yeah, you know, much But my point is, is, like, fuck. the guy who's made his career out of being a sarcastic, snarky shithead. Yeah. When you're not, when you're sitting next to David Spade, He's really a nice guy. Like he's yeah. definitely not. A- I mean, listen, I, I um, I think it's a worthy endeavor to attempt to find the places in which you do not give a fuck, you know. And I, and I think that I've definitely noticed myself change in that regard over silly things, little things. Like I used to be really, really um, consumed with like how outfits were put together or what, you know, yeah. th- there was an actually an anxiety about that. And that's from the fact that like, I grew up with a, you know, Eastern European father who appearance was incredibly important. And so there was anxiety around that, you know, and I've gotten to a place where I, I don't feel that anxiety as much anymore, which is huge growth. But I, also, I you, had, you, had that, you had that upbringing, but also then you were in Hollywood. And then and I was, like, well, I mean, I don't think that the, it's hard to, this, it's hard to escape the scrutiny of your appearance. Yeah. But listen, the world of scrutiny, scrutinizing appearance, you know? but think about the actors that we watch and that we love and that we feel pulled in by. And I can think I can name on, you know, probably one hand, the names of the people that when I watch, I know they genuinely don't care what anyone else thinks. And I, I, I think across all art forms, those are the people that we show up to yeah, see and to the, hear. You're hitting and to, the nail on the head. I, I think it's really valuable and really worthy to not give a fuck about what people think when it comes to your creativity, when it comes to your output. Yeah. Not caring what people think about you as a human being, I think is a dangerous place to get into. And far too many kids are confusing the two, you know, where they're taking like. Right. But, but don't you, don't you think that the people that get to that place actually do really give a fuck? Like, because the, the whole charade, the whole charade of it is that they do, they do give a mean? fuck. Meaning, if if you're trying so hard to not care as a human being, what what people think of you as a human being? Well, it shouldn't be effort. To well, that, not but care. that's what I'm saying is like, like it, I je- I don't care what people think about my Beavis and Butthead shirt. I know it's fucking sweet. <laughs> I don't have to put effort into but it. But it is you know? sweet. Like I don't think that you would. Have right, to that's care. a bad example. But I don't know people. A parody song I write. Yes, you know, that's I a great. I put idea. myself out there. I'll really. That's a really vulnerable place to be because you're like singing pretty and shit. Like I don't give a fuck if someone thinks you know. I, I there's been so many times where dudes are like Rudy is cringe, and I, and I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I, but pretty, you love him. You right, love Rudy. You know, and like I don't. It does. I genuinely don't give a fuck. I. That's a big difference between like if we leave. I, it matters to me. I definitely give a fuck if Giorgio called me and was like, dude, this guy, I can't deal with him anymore. He's a fucking asshole. Like, that matters. That matters to me. Yeah. I would like to think that the overwhelming majority of people that experience me, I care what they think about me. I do. I care. Okay, but but here's a good question then mm-hmm. in, in light of this, bringing Giorgio into it. If you said something that you really believed in, something that, you made a statement about something and yeah. that was what you actually thought. Yeah. And then Giorgio called you and said, you're a fucking asshole for saying that. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's the, the well, there's like a big difference between that. Yeah. Right. But that, but, but I think that's the importance is like you, you're, you're a person who is kind mm-hmm. contrary to what many people may believe. <laughs> you, <What? laughs> you are kind. Who's, who's, you, I'm just joking. But, um, and you are very sensitive and That's true. and Too you are anything. genuinely loving towards other people and at the same time you have beliefs and things that you do that you really don't care what anyone else thinks about yeah and so that is that is i think that fine line we're talking about but like if if somebody is an asshole because here's the I thing guess that, i guess that is the fine line there's a big fine line between your beliefs and yeah. your artwork and your exist your behavior but Be, i think like you know the i used to see it a lot with like the real housewives yeah where they're like love me or hate me i just don't care i'm who i am and i was like wait a second 
you know, you're not Ricky Gervais putting out a comedy special that might rub people the wrong way. And he's digging his heels in. you're just being a cunt. And then you expect people to be like, well, she doesn't care. Like, no, you should care. Right, you but, should but be, that's not also, be such a fucking wild cunt. That's also not authentic. They Maybe. do. They do. Those women. We know those women no, do care. Right. So I so I think it's, it goes back to like what you and I were talking about, about, you know, your reasons for wanting to to work out and to get in better shape. I think if if someone authentically feels and acts a certain way, I would much rather have that person in my life, even if, because here's the thing, so people think you're an asshole, you just don't engage with those people. There's people that think that Rudy, what Rudy says is disgusting. Yeah, but the you have to wonder if, like, I, I'm, 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 this is not an insult. I sometimes wonder, not the people who think Rudy's not funny, the people who think that Rudy's saying these things for real and that he's a real person, I genuinely wonder what their intellectual capacity is. Yeah, but who like cares? But that, I know, disabled. but that is, that's my, the point of it is that whatever you do, anybody, there's always going to be somebody that doesn't agree with it, that yeah, doesn't well, like it. Sure. And there are going to pe be people who take it personally and who's, who think that you're not a good person because it, it crosses that boundary for them about whatever they've decided okay, to be. Well, then, then you're, you're getting into something else too, which I think is a big problem. I don't think what people think about me or what they think about humans as a whole should have any bearing on whether or not you agree with them. Ex wait, explain that. Uh, You're my saying brain like, just exploded. Because I think it's very recent now. It's, it's only been a couple years where disagreeing with someone automatically makes them bad. Right. So yes. now, you know, you're you're conflating two things that I don't think should be conflated. And that is disagreeing with someone and not liking them. Yeah, but that's because where people, most people go I know, now. and that, and that uh, it's peculiar because uh, the whole basis of certainly the federal government was based on the idea that there were plenty of like really conservative people and really liberal people that totally disagreed. But when the gavel got put down, they'd hit up a bar on K Street and they're like, oh, this is my boy. Yeah, we don't see eye to eye on it, but who cares? You know, he's a good guy. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, let's dissect that for a second. Yeah. So if someone has a belief, like I remember my dad, you know, fled from Czechoslovakia in the late 60s, yeah. fled communism, came to this country because it was where people were free, yeah. right? He loved politics. That's why I went back to Nam. <laughs> to fight communism. Yes. I couldn't get enough, not, not enough bloodshed my first tour. I went back in summer All 72. Right. But he came here and he had very strong opinions about politics as one would yeah he talked to any, talk to any he, older cuban you talked to any older right Chinese but he yeah. loved the discourse he loved to have the conversations because of that fact yeah. because of here you could have those thoughts you could have those opinions you could discuss them freely and openly i remember my dad having incredibly heated yeah conversations with his friends you know, or, or someone at the table that someone else brought that thought something much different than he did. And then at the end of the conversation, it was done and over with. We, we have for the, the most part lost that ability. And my question is, and I actually did, we had like a discussion about God on my Instagram page the, the other day. And it was really fascinating because a lot of people shared it's very, fun, fun very topic. it was, fun. it was fun. Answer, I yeah. thought it was, um, because it was, it's because I love hearing why, people think and feel the way they do. I can sit with anyone and have a conversation about anything as as long as they're willing to do the same. But that's not it doesn't happen very often that be, and and so what what I'm asking is it takes it, it also takes a certain level of delicacy that not a lot of people want to display. But know. should it even take delicacy? No, but in a in a media capacity Sometimes it does, and it. Some people just don't have that, and I I, I see it, and right. I'm like I, I hate to be the guy that like looks on from the sidelines and criticizes major broadcasters, but very few people have, like I said, have the kind of 
control to to be able to have conversations with people that you, you know like i i'll never I'll, I'll never forget when i was having this argument with people about having milo yiannopoulos on the radio show and they're like how could you? milo yiannopoulos was like a he was a big kind of lightning rod of controversy in mid 2010s you know 2014 15 gay guy uh brit um really like flamboyant gay but he's also like extremely conservative he worked for daily uh, breitbart and stuff and he would say these anti-feminism anti kind of black lives matter whatever it was. He, he had a lot of controversial takes and uh i had him on the radio show and uh, he's a great he's a very smart guy he's a great interview and people were so upset that i would have him on and they're like would you have a clansman on the show I was like, well, of course. Fuck yeah. Yeah. I would have a Klansman. I would have a uh, a former Nazi. Like a, if you uncovered some Nazi in Germany or in, in Aust- uh, Argentina and he's like 105 and he's still lucid. I was like, oh, way in- interview that guy. Yeah. I'm not putting him on a pedestal. It's like that was. Do you understand like why the Ku Klux Klan wore hoods? So people wouldn't know. So they they wouldn't know who they were because they understood what they were doing was so good. It's like the fact that we live in a world where someone is willing to take the hood and talk. And I'd be like, let me break this down. But but, but you're in the clan. (laughs) I I think this is you're. I think you're hitting on something, though, that's so important, which is that we we, we, there's some huge fear that if we talk to people who have not only opinions that we disagree with, but opinions that we view as harmful or unsafe, if we talk to them or if we, if we let them have a, a, a place where yeah. they can speak, that somehow we're all going to be hypnotized by what they have to say or, or that, that, it, that they don't deserve to have a platform to, to speak to. But I think like we should be talking to all of those people. We should be sitting down. We should be getting Absolutely. curious about why. Tell me why. I want to know how you got to where you sit and think and feel. I want to know all of that because if I can better understand it, then maybe I can help act in a way or, or, or speak in a way or be some way that is going to be. It's a big mistake. We, you're right. You're totally right. Here, here's like the where I saw it play out the worst in my, the, with the most dire consequences in my lifetime yeah. because everything was really quiet about the cold war by virtue of it being the, like you never real like you didn't turn on the tv in 1985 and see like a russian spokesperson right it just didn't you know you know but man in 2003 2004 you absolutely saw a bunch of spokespeople for Islam, right? And it was one of two things. It was uh, usually like an American cleric who was living the truly holy life. And, mm-hmm. and you're and then someone would say like, and clearly that, you know, these people, these terrorists are not representative of, uh, of all Muslims because this man is, you know, and then it will, or it would be like some extremist, like some blogger, not even like a guy in Al Qaeda or something, and who would be like, you know, death to the infidels, Allah, la la la, you know, Allah Akbar, and you're all burn in hell, the Jews and the Americans would. And so you're left with this kind of really ripe field for whether it be MSNBC or Fox News to kind of pick and choose to how they're going to play this out, right? And so what we got as the American public is like Osama bin Laden and the rest of the extremist Islamic world hates America because of our freedom. And then, you know, guys can get really riled up and be like, fucking let's go fuck them up because they hate us for our freedom. Well, we're going to show them. And it's like, whoa, let's pump the brakes a bit. Right. And if we were to, for 30 years, be putting journalists or microphones in front of people in Afghanistan and Syria and the Arab peninsula and, he realizes like, well, no, uh, America, amongst other countries, has propped up dictators that have murdered my family and then come through and then taken down that dictator. And, uh, you know, in the mountains of Afghanistan, we were your ally. A lot of my friends died killing Russians. And now you're carpet bombing us. 
and uh, we are kind of used as pawns in like this weird game that you play with other superpowers and we're tired of it. We don't care how you live. We don't care about fucking Coca-Cola and we don't care about freedom. And we don't, it's just like, since I was a little boy, I've watched a lot of NATO planes kill people. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck's going on, but this guy over here told me that you're the devil. And I kind of see these planes carpet bombing people all the time. And I do remember my grandpa telling me that he was in the Mujahideen and he used to fight alongside Americans. And then we kind of got fucking abandoned and now you're killing us. Like if that was out there, there'd be a really high level, a really high chance that we would not be engaging in seven, eight wars at the given time when Obama went in office with two and now we have like eight, there's a really good chance it wouldn't have proliferated that because most people would be like, well, wait a second. You, this fellow's right. I, I watched Rocky two. I watched Rambo two. I remember how brave those Afghanis were when they fought alongside Rambo and they killed Russians. And then uh, I remember seeing Rambo four when we go into Afghanistan, we blow the fuck out of people. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of, Intricacies where you just kind of get because you're scared to talk to people. Yeah, that was the that was the 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 giant difference you saw. Like, and I wasn't alive uh, as much many jokes as I make, but I was not alive during the Vietnam War. But during the Vietnam War, when you watch video of it, there's journalists running all over the fucking place. It's crazy. It's crazy. There's people with press outfit, like military uniform, but with press. And they're like, oh, shit. And then filming documentaries and talking to Viet Cong, talking to to uh, allied Vietnamese. You, you got some level of belief. It was probably sanitized highly. It was probably controlled by the government. But you got some sense that you were getting access to what was going on. And when you're looking back on it, you, you realize a lot of it was kind of manipulated. Um, the idea of like the spread of communism. But either way. You got to send like that's not you see terrorist attacks and then you're told this is why. Yeah. And it's not, you know, like if we were to take time to. And and don't hear me. Listen, please. I want to make it very clear. Once those decisions have been made, once the people enact any form of terror, it's it's time to go and you send in whatever military you want and you you evaporate those people. I have no qualms about saying that but i don't like this let us tell you why this is happening because it's not coming from the people themselves you know no, what I'm and, I, and that might not be something that ever changes you know it's not it isn't and i wonder like i wonder with trans stuff i wonder with black stuff i wonder like because we're hearing from like two activists is that really how every trans person is this how is this person well, collecting I, cash for this like very visible civil rights act? Is that how black people feel? Like I'd love to know. Everything you know? essentially that we know yeah. or that we hear comes through the funnel of the news, whether that be the news media, whether that be social media, whether that be, you know, and any sort of, uh, platform that is having videos or, you know, so it's not like any of us are ever sitting down with each other and you're in this side of it and I'm on this side of it. And I say like, tell me what's going on. I mean, I've had conversations with people, friends of mine, acquaintances that may be on one side of an opinion or one side of a movement. And those conversations are always vastly different than anything I'm hearing that filters down to me through larger. Well, kind of regardless if they're conservative or liberal, right? It's just different than the narrative that you're hearing. Yeah, well, it has a personal spin on it. It has somebody talking about how it feels for them. And that to me is always going to be a larger Im impetus for me to change my behavior in any given way because somebody that I care about or someone that maybe I don't even know is now telling me what their personal experience has been and it's an exchange between two individuals understanding each other it's not well, it is also 
unfortunately, that's just not most people's experience too. It's like, there's this guy, his name's Daryl. I forgot his last name, but he's named Daryl. And his purpose, he's a black dude. His whole purpose is he goes around talking to Klansmen and, and racists. And he's collected like hundreds of Klan hoods. Like got people to completely. They, yeah. And he's like, people are like, what do you do? Do you have a seminar? Do you? He's like, I talk with them. We just hang out. It all started with one. I was at a blues bar, listen, and I'm having a beer, talking to this guy. And at the end of the conversation, beautiful cover. He's like, I can't believe I've never talked to a black man this long. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a fucking Klansman. He's like, whoa. And it just it dovetailed. It's infinitely more effective than any kind of documentary series or book. Or because you're just actually interacting with human beings, and so uh, uh, Jason Ellis and a couple of a couple of my gay friends are like, "How are you so comfortable with both behind the scenes and then in, in, in kind of in front of everyone with gay stuff?" And I go, "I'd say I, 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 it was an effort. I I grew up in a household where there was gay people, and you'd be shocked how little kids give a shit about anything." I remember, you know, I, my parents had a gay male friend and his name was Tom. And I remember it. So they had other gay male friends, but I remember this one specific because his fucking boyfriend's name was Jerry. And I thought that was the funniest <laughs> thing. Because they're Tom and yeah. Jerry. Um, and uh, one day they were having like a, like a summer party. I remember it was like really hot outside and I was running around like crazy. And uh, they were like, not vulgar, but they were kissing, you know. That's my dad. I was like, uh, "What's up with that?" Your dad, your dad, yeah. said, "What's up with that?" No, I asked my dad. Oh, I was, oh. I was like, I was at my old house, so I was five, yeah. four. I'm like, what's up? what's up with that, dudes kissing? Um, and my dad was smoking a cigar, and he's like, "Well, you know how mom and I love each other?" And I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, Tom and his boyfriend—that's how they love." I'm like, all right, and I'm gonna go watch Star Wars. The you know, yeah. and it's like. If you feed your kids nothing but mac and cheese and chicken strips, when they're 16, that's all they're going to really want. And they're going to look at sushi and they're going to look at Indian food and they're going to be like, holy fuck, are you out of here? But if you're feeding your kids dim sum and tandoor chicken and 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 Thai food since really young age, they grow up, that's normal. But also, right? yes, but also I think what's important to note is that your dad didn't make it a big deal. Your dad just My dad said, makes nothing a big deal. Your dad just stated it as it is. Yeah. And I think this is the problem is that we're making all of these things and and I understand it from the perspective that people think in order to make change, they have to make something a very big deal. But the problem is is then you run into people with opposing opinions. And they feel the big dealness of that. And it feels like I don't, I can't, no, this is my belief. This is how I, you know, whereas. Well, yeah, and a lot of stuff. We should wrap this up. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to answer the questions that we solicited for. Yeah. But a lot of the stuff here, here's something that I really, and I, I stand behind this. Cause like most things I go, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but this is how I see it. This is I, I, something that I really think is important. And I, and I, I firmly believe that is that people have collected way too much shit that they think makes their identity. Yeah. Because your identity is a really narrow thing. And it's probably pretty personal. But now everyone's like their fucking clothes, the food they eat. Like, I'm a carnivore. I'm a vegan. I'm a, like, illnesses. I'm like, it's food. Yeah. Uh, the medications you take or don't take. Yeah. The type of martial arts you do. Everything's part of people's identities now. And it's like, no, that's just... Well, Something yeah, because enjoy, we, don't enjoy, we give yeah. everyone pages where they get to fill out. This is who I am, right? You come to my page. I'm going to have a bio and then I'm going to tell you in two sentences that this is who I am. And it sucks because I kind of kind of thought for a while we got away from it. I remember when I was a, when I was a kid, if you went to see Pennywise and you had a fucking Pantera shirt on, you were going to get your ass kicked. <laughs> and if you went to see Pantera and you had a no FX shirt on, you're going to get your fucking ass kicked. Like, for reals. Like, punk... And and it's, like, this much difference. Like, punk rock and heavy metal guys. Like, oh, look at that fucking punker. Oh, look at that fucking long hair. And you dudes would fight over it. And then it just kind of became a thing where it's like, who cares? Like, you know, I really like Blink-182, but I really like gutter punk, too. You know, I like I like gutter mouth. I like, I like hip-hop. I like fucking Slayer. You know, it was... 
And then now we're back to like everything has to be clearly defined in these classes, you know. Do, do you think we solved some things here today? Because I don't, I feel like we just talked around in circles. But but it was a great episode. <laughs> you're, you're such an engaging person. Oh, thank you. Are we- Dr. Strange Lou says, what do you folks make of this alien stuff? How credible is the whistleblower? Probably bigger and more real things to worry about? Question mark. I mean, I don't know if there are bigger or more real things to worry about. But like, if it's true, what are we going to do about it? I don't think there's really much to worry about it. Right? I agree. I don't, like, yeah, either they're gonna be happy, fun aliens, or they're gonna, or they're gonna <laughs> blow, the, blow us the fuck up and enslave us. Uh, and either way, there's nothing we can do. Here's about one it. thing I want to say about aliens. Yeah, this is serious. I want everyone in the media to get on their knees and suck Tom DeLonge's balls, Art Bell. Alex Jones, Eddie Bravo, all you motherfuckers who get ridiculed for being like, have, have you read this? Hey, oh my God, have you read this? I can't believe it. They have alien uh, DNA in Egypt. Alex Jones like, oh, you gotta believe it. It's all Texas. They landed in uh, 1932. We have actual proof of the military. Tom DeLong for fucking 10 years. I can't believe it. You don't believe I have proof and all this. Every one of you people said they're kooks and they should put on their goddamn tinfoil hats. Just get on your knees. Go get some knee pads because you're going to be there a while and just suck on their fat cocks. Thank you.